Good afternoon. Welcome all to uh, this uh, session on um, new models of uh, investment for countries in transitions. I just said to my uh, fellow uh, panelists that this could be the title of a serious uh, econometric study in an academic journal, but looking at the faces around here, I understand you're not coming to hear about that. Um, uh, we have a very distinguished and experienced panel um, going from uh, clockwise. Uh, Minister Oda, who is the Minister of uh, Economic Development in the Palestinian Authority. Uh, David Walker, who is a long-time uh, banker, also city banker, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, very experienced in the, uh, in the areas which we are discussing this afternoon. Kaiko Honda, who is with the uh, 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 Bismika, which is uh, one of the, uh, well, actually the most important FDI institution which we have uh, uh, internationally, and uh, I have Nakvi, who is a, if I may call it that, practitioner. Maybe you would like to call yourself an entrepreneur, CEO, or investor, but I call you a practitioner. You can call me what you like. Uh, um, um, uh, so the topic which we are discussing in the next uh, 60 minutes, uh, live streamed, I'm saying that for all the participants in this room that you are aware, uh, is really about the future of economic growth uh, in transition countries. And transition countries uh, can be defined in various ways. We will not try to define them, but it's obviously that uh, many emerging markets are transition countries, but as Arif joked just before uh, we were uh, uh, entering the room, of course, some of the industrialized countries are also going through major transitions. Um, so basically, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the question on the table uh, for everyone is, what do we know about uh, uh, higher risk perception, about political risk analysis, about uncertain long-term prospects, and what does all of that mean for foreign direct investments in these countries, which is the largest part of the world, of course. Um, we will start off with uh, Kaiko Honda, uh, who will tell us about lessons learned in these transition countries. And uh, if you have any flavor to add on the region, Kaiko, please do so. Well, Professor Halverstadt, thank you very much for having me in this panel discussions with very exciting um, agenda. Many countries in transitions face tremendous uncertainty. Although uncertainty is not necessarily the same as the risk, private investors often see this uncertainty as a primary source of risk. What we have learned at MIGA is private investors feel concern but cannot articulate the concern. So I recommend to slice their concern into several different categories. There are six real risks in my perspective. First one is private investors cannot convert their debt repayment or dividend into hard currency and transfer out to their home country. Second risk is the potential damage from the war on civil disturbance. Third risk is the uh, expropriation risk where government taking over your project. And uh, then a fourth risk is the potential breach of the, co breach of the contract by the government. And a fifth risk is a commercial risk. But this commercial risk does exist in any countries, even in, if I borrow Mr. Uh, Professor Haberstadt's word, it's industrialized country, including the United States. And a sixth risk is the foreign exchange fluctuation. This also does exist in any parts of the world. US dollar does fluctuate against the euro and um, as well as the Japanese yen. Um, well, then I think, you know, rather than kind of showing the concern, making a concern, we really have to kind of slice their concern so therefore we can really reach up to the real risk. Um, there are actually many multinational development banks that exist, but Amiga, as uh, Professor Hoverstadt mentioned, is one of the few specialized in de-risking. We provide political risk insurance, 
covering those first four risks that I just want to mention in many parts of the world. Giving our timing, I'm not going to go through the old example that we actually covering, but let me give you one example. This is the Jordanian entrepreneur who invested in Iraq, the transportation sector. Mega has been supporting Nafis Logistics since 2014, building and managing system to regulate track passing through the three ports in the Basra region and across Kuwaiti border. With Mega's support, Nafis Logistics is bringing job to Iraq modernizing the logistics network and using data-driven system to enhance efficiency, strengthening the security of the transport and facilitate the trade. Although these contribute toward increasing the economic activity, which ultimately improving the security of the region. I just like to say, so the key, what we actually, based on our learning, working in a multiple different countries in a transition is slice the risk and then de-risk. There are a lot of de-risking instruments available through multiple DFIs. So that's our lessons learned right now. Thank you, Craig. Uh, that made a very a series of remarks, which of course will lead to possible reaction from, uh, from uh, other panelists or for the room, and we'll get back to that uh, in a moment. Now, uh, David, um, what have you learned? I mean, what, um, what do you, what does your own institution, and what do you tell your, your advisors, your, as advisors, what do you tell your clients about these countries in transition? Do you deal with them differently? Thank you, Victor. Um, first of all, a big thank you to the Kingdom of Jordan really, for hosting us and, and the World Economic Forum for convening this. This is a terrifically important topic. Worth saying that, um, to your introductory point, uh, we've been physically present here you know, for many decades in, in Jordan and across the, the MENA region. So um, we, we've had some experience of bringing you know, the world to MENA and bringing MENA out to, to, to the world. Let me just offer a few, I guess, private sector banker perspectives. Um, the sort of the key bullets are, are one, uh, you know, we're having this conversation because there is opportunity, um, but advocacy around that opportunity is needed. Um, the, the level of understanding you know, of the region, of the opportunity is extremely variable depending on where you go outside of the region. But the demand side is clear and what we're talking about is helping develop the supply side and you know, getting the, 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 um, the investment in. So what are the challenges that are, that are faced by international investors? Let's spend a minute on that in a second. Kiko has just um, explained this, this issue of unpacking the risks. And uh, I think there is, a, there is a thread running through this uh, of some old fashioned views of risk and some, some now emerging more sophisticated uh, views of risk. And in unpacking the risks, who are the right holders? You know, who are the right people to take those, those risks um, um, going forward? I will also mention the importance of local markets. Mm -hmm. um, you many think of the, the big international organizations, whether it's Amiga, City or others, um, as essentially large international hard currency denominated institutions. But actually the ability to, to operate in local currency and, and to develop local capital markets is going to be key. That's, that develops resilience and that those are engines of growth. Uh, and then in all of this, and particularly with the theme of the forum, you know, we can't uh, forget about the investing in youth angle. Uh, and I think you know, the skills and training and investment in the youth, which is going to be the capacity building uh, for these, these markets, uh, is going to be key. And then lastly, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of think a little bit uh, through the course of this dialogue on some misalignments, um, because you know, one of the big issues that transition economies are facing uh, is the withdrawal of certain players and, and, and of large scale um, uh, financial services uh, involvement. You know, the advantage to all of us, of course, on transition economies is we have a chance to go where others are not going at the moment. Um, so there's not only all the, the social and um, political benefits, there's enormous economic benefit available to, to us and, and to our clients. Quickly, um, just expanding on one or two of those, in terms of the key challenges and, and the constraints, I think Kiko has, has laid those out um, very clearly, and, and, and I won't repeat them, but the, the political risks 
are the starting point for most of our international investors. You know, the, the, the commercial risks are, are, are manifold and manifest, but, uh, but it's the political risks that need definition and, and, and need support. It's also worth saying the role of government uh, in, in all of this is key. Government is dominant in these economies. Government um, has you know, advocacy uh, and enabling power, but also needs to know when to get out of the way. Um, and in transition economies, you know, there's a little bit less institutional strength and depth. And that's where you know, big international official organizations such as the World Bank and MIGA have a, have a great role to play. In the unpacking of those risks that we talked about and the allocation efficiently of those risks to, to the right holders, um, you know, I think the, the, our conversation today would range around some of the solutions, but you know, what in this we mustn't forget to talk about is you know, non-standard forms of, of finance. You know, I'm speaking from the perspective of, of a large you know, kind of dollar-centric international bank, and you know, we've got private equity at the table, but social bonds, you know, ODA forms of, of finance, blended finance, and let's not forget some of the new tools that are out there, such as supply chain finance, you know, which are you know, very, very kind of locally um, uh, powerful. The, the development of the domestic pools of capital, that is key to resilience. Um, there's obviously no question we've seen tremendous strides uh, in some of the markets in the MENA region, as we have seen in, say, the Central and Eastern European regions. Um, you know, and that, uh, that capital market, that debt and equity capital market, becomes the engine room for growth. And it also prices the risk and the, and the availability um, properly. Um, in the investing in people, um, I'll simply say that I think all of us have both an economic uh, as well as a more philanthropic interest in, in getting this right. And we've talked about the, the youth and the, and the levels of unemployment amongst that youth in this region. And yet they're bursting with ideas, as we've seen on, on other panels here. Um, worth saying that through our own lens, your city through its foundation, uh, the pathways to progress, um, we've got $100 million that we're deploying into youth empowerment and education you know, between now and 2020, much of it in the MENA region. And we've got terrific partners here like Fadi Gandur, you know, the inspirational leader of, uh, um, of the, um, the Rawad uh, organization and others that, that we're working with on that. But let me end by saying let's not also lose sight in, in all this, this sort of moving forward of the things that are moving back. And I'm going to pick out correspondent banking. I'm going to pick out uh, trade finance. Um, and the very cautious stance that a number of international players uh, are taking on some transition economies, principally as a result of post 9 11 you know, FATF driven you know, behaviors. Um, you know, so there's, there's a little bit of an edge that, that we need to keep an eye on. Thank you, David. Um, are we, so the lessons learned living in the region and practicing largely in the region. Uh, must be sizable. There is, of course, enormous disruption in the region. What can you tell us that we should be aware of as the, as the essentials here? So it's always, um, it's always very easy to get disillusioned and disheartened and to start thinking of risk as an all-encompassing phenomenon. And what I'd like to start by saying is that, you know, globally, um, we are not being very innovative when we look at risk. The perception of risk in today's world is extremely skewered. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, somebody somewhere won a Nobel Prize many decades ago by devising risk models around the developed world, the industrialized world, the so-called third world at the time, which we now mistakenly refer to as emerging markets. Um, I say mistakenly because, you know, I call them global growth markets. Yeah. Because whether we like it or not, two-thirds of global growth is going to come from these markets in the next few decades. Mm -hmm. So let's just get that bit right and then tackle the issue of what risk actually looks like and what risk means. Because if you look at the last decade or so, where did risk actually come from uh, in the global financial landscape? Risk came from the heart of Wall Street. Risk came from Lehman Brothers. Yeah. Okay. And you talked earlier about political risk as being an important element of uh, our thinking when we're looking at project finance. Well, you know what? In today's world, the biggest political risk came from Brexit. The next political risk came from the election uh, in the United States. And look at all of our fears around France. Yeah. So there is a little bit of a misperception that is going on. And I'd like to use as a data point a very interesting study that was done recently uh, around 5,000 infrastructure projects around the world uh, and the um, eventual conclusion of success 
uh, around those 5,000 projects. And the failure rate in Africa was 1%. The failure rate in North America was 9%. Okay? So let's just for a second take a step back and say that maybe it is time to relook at risk. Maybe it is time to relook at the way in which we measure risk. So that's my first point. My second point is that we've been here before, okay? And um, we've had countries in transition. Look at the end of the Second World War. Uh, there was the creation of something called the Marshall Plan, okay? Uh, which resulted in taking countries in transition and countries that were at that point essentially failed nation states mm -hmm. and redefining how to rebuild their economies. And at that point, I don't think anyone was adding on risk premia yeah. for helping rebuild infrastructure in those economies. Mm -hmm. So we learned the lessons, then we quickly forgot them, and now we're beginning to relearn them again. And, and I feel that we have in today's world a very interesting development that is happening. It's called One Belt, One Road, which the Chinese government is um, unveiling at speed now. And that is a very interesting thing, which is, you know, they took their infrastructure-led, investment-led growth, which took 800 million people out of poverty in the last two decades, and they're now applying that to countries around them. And they're spending the equivalent of 15 Marshall Plans in the course of the next decade in economies around them that are important to China. And this includes Vietnam, and it includes Kenya. Okay, so it's across the board, yes. and that money is being spent without that traditional perception of what risk means. So my view around this thinking is we've all got to take a step back. We've got to take a long, deep thought process, which needs to have a lot of consensus around it, and we need to start thinking long term. We need to start thinking about where the pools of capital are coming from. And I have to say, one of the leaders globally in this thinking is Jim Kim at the World Bank, who is actually, as we speak, redefining how to bring private capital, and it's interesting that it's coming from the president of the World Bank, how to bring private capital at work in infrastructure projects and long-term uh, investment thinking. And I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude this little introduction with a discussion around the Sustainable Development Goals. Because, you know, again, We've sat down and written up the Sustainable Development Goals. It wasn't one man's idea or 10 people's idea. It was a consensus decision taken by a stakeholder approach by 200 countries around the world, mm -hmm. by the smartest people in multilateral and uh, organizations, NGOs, civil society, and business. These Sustainable Development Goals exist. But the problem is that if we start thinking about the implementation of those as the ambit of NGOs or multilaterals, we're instantly wrong. What we should be doing at that point is taking business and seeing the profitability inherent in investing in those spaces. Because what are those spaces? Those spaces are healthcare, education, low-income housing. And I can keep going down that list of food security and so on. And if we start applying private sector principles, we will do very well. So risk, in, in summary, is a slightly, um, uh, is a concept in need of innovation. As everything else in the world is getting innovated, we need to innovate our thinking around that. And most importantly, we need to start thinking that whatever we do in this space, when we start thinking about how to deploy capital, are we investing with impact or are we investing for impact? Because neither of those need to forego the profit imperative. Thank you, Arif. Uh, that's, it's a really intriguing question whether we should uh, uh, re rethink the concept of risk. And, and I'll invite uh, Kaiko and, and David later to react. And Minister, you may already may want to react uh, because I know you're very aware of this question. First, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. It's a great opportunity. Uh, of course, you know, I'd like to thank WIF and as well, you know, talking about this very interesting subject, you know, when talking about like, you know, investment in countries with uh, in transition. Actually, I don't know, transition means that you start, you know, this year and you'll end after five or six years or probably if it takes longer, it takes like, you know, 10 years. But in Palestine is different. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's like, you know, I can't, I can't, you know, say that we are a country of, uh, in a transition because we don't know when the occupation will end. But anyway, we cannot, uh, you know, uh, either the countries uh, in transition or country like Palestine cannot left behind. So we have to attract investors. Investment is very important for uh, any country that is uh, in transition or under, uh, under occupation. Uh, it's a key for economic growth. But uh, the government do have a huge role to mitigate the risk, the political risk, which is assisted by any investor. You know, always investor assist risk before investing in any country. And uh, countries under uncertainty, countries uh, under occupation, the political risk is very high. So the, how to mitigate from government point of view to focus on the infrastructure, to have uh, industrial zones, as an example, provide incentives, and as well to work on the legal framework of the country and to work on the related laws and regulations mm. that can help the investors, you know, to come to invest in these countries, and uh, of course uh, having. Uh, like, you know, related uh, laws and regulation as the case in Palestine. Recently, uh, we passed the leasing law, which is very important for the SMEs, since we have more than 90% of our businesses SMEs, the secure transaction, and recently the companies law. This would help the SMEs to grow and uh, help the investors to jointly work with the SMEs and to work on <coughs> developing uh, these uh, companies and help them to access finance. As well, there is other uh, role for the government to focus on ed education and awareness. Education is important. Uh, we need to focus on vocational, uh, vo uh, vocational training and as well uh, try to bring investors with uh, new ideas, uh, know-how, uh, know in order to have uh, competitive uh, products, competitive uh, ideas, and to reach the foreign and to cover the local market as well. And we have to work on the media, because many countries with uncertainties, you know, probably do have a very high potential but people, you know, just hear the news and, you know, it's uh, uncertainty, uh, lots of difficulties. But, <clears throat> sorry, but in fact, there is uh, a high potential. Uh, there are success stories that need to be presented to the whole world that, okay, uh, even with the difficulties that we are facing with the occupation, but still we have untapped potential that we should focus on and should attract the investors. In our case, diaspora, Palestinian diaspora, are very important for us because when they uh, think of investing in Palestine, they first, they don't think of profit or making a profit. It's like, you know, cultural uh, diplomacy. You know, they can invest in Palestine, uh, bring other investors with them, and, of course, uh, strengthen the Palestinian economy. And this is, in fact, one of the things that we are focusing recently on it. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we will, in the second round, uh, speak in some more detail about some of this. But let me first go back to the question I quickly raised after Arif had spoken. <laughs> this concept of risk, David. Uh, um, in your experience, is Arif correct in thinking that we may need to uh, do some innovation here, uh, and that risk may be a different concept than uh, we have uh, so far uh, uh, understood or and actually taught to other people? David. So in short, yes, Arif is spot on. Um, uh, and has, has everybody got it wrong, and, and now we need to do it differently? No, I think it's a continuum, um, and the world has changed. You know, and uh, with innovation in uh, technology and industry and in government and in public service, 
it has to be matched by innovation in our understanding and analysis and provision for risk. Um, because we've, we've taken some very blunt um, uh, risk assessments you know, in, in, in the past. Um, this, this is where it comes back to this, um, this sort of theory of sort of unpacking all the risks and, and trying to understand you know, if, 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 a, if a chain, an economic chain is presented to us, each of those links has a different type of and size of risk associated with it. You know, from, from equity risks and commercial risks all the way through to, to political convertibility and, and other risks. And there will be some very idiosyncratic risks associated with some of the markets that our clients choose to operate in. Um, Arif also mentioned the, the, the very key um, uh, so one belt, one road strategy you know, for, for the Chinese. And uh, I think what I would say there is that is in many ways the, it's such an accelerated, such an ambitious program that what we have the kind of the, almost the, sort of the wonderful opportunity of observing is this sort of great ambition. And therefore, there is the sort of this move to the unpacking and the, and the management of these risks in a hurry, um, which is going to help us all move you know, to, to the next phase. Um, what is also changing uh, at this moment in time is the, is the multilateral and the development organizations uh, and, and, and the, should we, candidly, kind of the whole arena. Amiga is to be commended um, on the, I mean, for an organization that's only been around for 30 years, you know, they're right now going through yet another revolutionary um, redesign of the products, you know, the, the political risk and the credit enhancement products that are going to be made available to, to, to the marketplace. Um, that means that, to the point earlier on about crowding in, those who look at this chain and say, actually, I love this project, I love this country, I, I love this opportunity, but there are two links in this chain that, frankly, for bureaucratic, historical, rule-based reasons, I'm just never going to get there. If we can understand that, and we have the tools to take those out and transpose those to the right holders, the appropriate holders paid, you know, a rate that they want to be paid for that, we're going to see a whole lot more getting done, just like One Belt, One Road. Um, and, um, and we should see this evolution towards you know, greater understanding. Kaiko, would you like to comment on this? Because yes. you, know, you are yep. involved in this concept of measuring risk, and so. Absolutely. First of all, before touching upon the risk definition, I have to 100% agree with the Alif about private sector can be a primary party to stimulate economic activity, which is the primary step in transition. That's, I 100% agree with you. I, I assume others also agreeing. Based on that, when it comes to the risk, I am not a scholar, so therefore I'm not the specialist of defining or redefining risk. But the one thing I can really tell you is sovereign risk used to be associated with the project risk, which is moving. As a matter of fact, I'd just like to give a one practical example that we worked on to de-rank the sovereign risk with the project risk. EBR, the European Bank of, uh, uh, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, and Amiga jointly worked in Turkey. This is Hilski, a PPP project. Equity investor is Meridian. They decided to issue a project bond. We worked with the rating agency Moody's. The project bond got two notch above the sovereign rating of Turkey. So unfortunately, Turkey got downgraded recently, but this project bond still investment grade. That kind of de-ranking sovereign risk and a project risk is happening. I'm so, sure you would like to react to that. Yeah, no, look, I, I thank you for agreeing to start with. But the, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll give you a live example. Okay, uh, three and a half years ago, four years, three years ago, we invested in a dairy uh, producing business in Turkey uh, called Your Son. And at the time, exactly at that time, uh, President Erdogan was going through enormous street pro protests in Taksim Square. The country uh, was going through a currency uh, stress. Uh, Turkish pricing around its risk was going through the roof. And we invested in there at the same time. Uh, banks were very, very anxious, very nervous 
as to what I was doing and what we were doing as a firm, and, uh, and really put us through the, the grind there, okay? Mm -hmm. And I responded to them actually on CNN because I was interviewed that day um, by, uh, on this topic, and I responded, look, Turks are going to drink milk irrespective of who governs them, okay? And the reality is you've got to have a local understanding of where opportunity and risk lies. Mm -hmm. There's an old mathematical adage, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which is the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil can cause a tornado in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. In today's globalized world, that's never mm -hmm. been more true, okay? So people worry about emerging market currencies as being a source of disruption. Well, the reality is it's not that they're weak, it's that the US dollar is strong. Okay, and so if you flip the equation around on its head, you can actually solve a lot of issues by applying practical, sensible outcomes. And, you know, between lender and borrower come out with a more fundamental understanding of where opportunity is and where the real risk lies as well. Thank you. Now let's first look to the audience and see who would like to raise either a question or have a comment. Um, gentleman, row two over there, and then I'll get to you. Yeah, I was curious about uh, that uh, rating that uh, in Turkey that was two notches above the sovereign risk. Was uh, was that for a, a debt instrument or an equity uh, in foreign currency or for in local currency? David, I think it's a question for you. I'm not sure. No, it was would you, you like me to, okay, yeah, would you like me to yeah. answer? Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, hard currency based transaction. Yes. Thank you. Gentlemen over here. You're getting a microphone, just wait. wait. Hey. It's a question for Ms. Honda. Um, so we, we, as a group, we are in the region for the last 40 years, investing in building infrastructure. And the two key challenges we see is capacity and tenor. Mm -hmm. um, there is an issue about risk. And while one belt, one road is one solution, but China's debt is twice its GDP. Uh, and if you contrast that with the GCC, it's a different world. There's a far greater capacity to do more things. Um, Within the MENA, GCC and North Africa are two completely different markets in terms of risk. So my question to you is, uh, you see MEGA, you see ICIC here in the region, but you neither see the capacity nor see the tenor to sustain long-term infrastructure projects. It's not so much so capital, but really an equivalent of a MEGA for the region. Uh, do you see such a need from what you do? I know. That's a that's a very good question. Yeah, I think liquidity it does exist in this region. So therefore liquidity is not necessarily the everything. Rather people are kind of looking for good agreement among the government, what the tariff is, what the role of equity investors. If, if it's PPP's case, what kind of expertise that they can bring to, then what's therefore leftover risk that the lenders can assume? This is actually probably exactly the point David mentions in his first intervention, how much risk each of them take. At the same time, what kind of expertise each of them bring to and it can build a consensus project going. People often use the word, word of bankable. Mm. I don't like that so much. It's not only the bank. What is kind of acceptable, good, agreeable condition of government, equity, investors, and lenders, including the expertise produce, you know, contributor? I think that's, that's, if that is your question, yes. That's great. May I? Yes, David. May, may I just add something to that? Because um, uh, I think the, the question's an excellent question, and, and we can answer it sort of more metaphorically by saying, actually, the answer to, usually to these questions is, is yes, because the more partners that we bring to this topic, to this table, the better. 
you know, MEGA is a tremendously sophisticated global leader you know, in, in, in political risk management. But we need governments, we need academia, we need, we need private sector, private equity, and we need the banking industry. I also agree, we have to get away from the, the B word, the bankable projects. It's the I word. Is it investable? Because you know, the old style thinking that RF rightly refers to is, here's a project, bank, please give me the money. This is, this is not the chain that we're talking about where every link is a different type of risk. So you know, the crowding in of more participants, you know, government has a role to play, advocacy from, 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 the, uh, from the academic sector, frankly, the trillions that are available uh, in, in the private sector markets. This is the key. So what we need to see is, you know, a, and this, this forum is a, is a, terrific, a terrific convening power here because you know, everybody in this room has a role to play in this. And the more we all advocate, the more people become closer to the subject. You know, and, and dare I say it, from the minister's point of view, you know, the Palestinian Authority is probably well understood right here and probably almost completely misunderstood everywhere else. So you know, the greater the advocacy, the greater the number of participants, the more we're going to find you know, that blend. You know, and the World Economic Forum, of course, and the OECD you know, famously put the blended finance tag together you know, to, to explain precisely this. And we need to, we need to, we need to chase that. That's a very clear answer, uh, David, but that raises a question. What are the practical obstacles then that you, which need to be removed, say, take this region, not only Palestine, but take this region. What are the practical obstacles which need to be removed for it to be more attractive, to use that term? Uh, let, me, let me maybe start by saying, um, and, and I think um, uh, Keiko and the minister both, both referred to it in their comments, um, stability and practicality of some of the underlying law. You know, there, there is one thing that lies completely outside of the, uh, the competency of the financial sector, but of course you know, we, can, we can advocate and we can ask for various things. You know, Arif as an investor is going to want to know that you know, there is a dispute resolution mechanism. Um, he's also going to want to know that, you know, that there, is, there is a means by which you know, the earnings associated with, it, with a project you know, can be you know, convert it into the currency that he needs for his next transaction and, and remit it out. Um, it is really the harmonization uh, of a lot of that. But from an intermediary's point of view, our job also is to, on the other side, on the investor side, is to understand what type of risks our investor base want. Um, again, there's some very conventional thinking still going on in the financial markets. You know, is somebody an equity investor? Is somebody a debt investor? Is somebody prepared to do loan investing? You know, there are many, many graduations in between, and there's all sorts of contingent risks uh, that people are very keen to be paid for, whether they're in the official sector or in the, in the private sector. Thank you. I read on this. So I, I, I just want to endorse what David was saying, because I think what you've, what you've hit upon is actually something that not too many people talk about, but you know, should be amplified and, and screamed out, which is, is a project investable as opposed to bankable? And, and when you think about it in that context, then you immediately bring in the needs of all sorts of stakeholders. And if you do that, then by definition, you rethink the capital structure. Yes. And so you asked about innovation and new products. Well, if you can rethink the capital structure, you can certainly rethink many elements of that capital structure as well, and where first loss guarantees sit, where uh, you know, mega products sit, where you can actually use insurance companies which actually need to have AAA wrappers in order to uh, consider uh, investing into long-term project finance, you can bring in a layer below of risk capital that does not necessarily or traditionally invest in this space. And all of a sudden, you've got a whole slew of new products. And, and the last point that I'd like to add in, in this sort of space is that the more innovation that comes into project finance, the greater the capacity of all of us to deal with our problems. Because when you talk about nations in transition, we are not talking about them setting up the next French fries plant, okay, or the next bottled uh, water business. We're talking about hospitals, schools, bridges, dams, roads, highways. For that, you need lots of capital. And philosophically, I'm always at a loss to understand, and I'm not being provocative here, but I'm always at a loss to understand, why do sovereign wealth funds, whose entire mandate is meant to be to safeguard the wealth that is currently being generated for future generations, 
why do they put their money in buildings in various cities around the world, why don't they put it into long-term project finance that is going to yield them stable 3 to 6% returns? Because that way you're doing good for society, you're doing good for long-term stability, and you're producing the returns that inherently their future recipients of that money are going to need. So I'm just saying it's time for all of us to rethink the paradigm under which we look at this space. Now, Minister, hearing all of this, what are the lessons for you? Actually, for uh, attracting investors, ease of doing business is very important. <clears throat> because, you know, most countries, you know, cannot attract investors because of the process of, like, you know, registering the company or getting approvals from different, uh, like, you know, the health, uh, uh, environment, uh, whatever. So this will make it very hard for the investors to be attracted. As well, you know, since we have challenges, we have political risk or uncertainty or whatever. So we have to work on the process, on easing the process of doing business. You know, mega is important, very important in countries with difficulties, of course. And as well, uh, we uh, should focus uh, on diversification. You know, most countries uh, are focusing on uh, one line of uh, either productions of, or business or whatever. And we have, um, you know, we have to focus on what we have, what comparative advantage that we have, and to highlight it in order to be a guideline for the investors. You know, here you can invest, here you can make money. It's not like, you know, to sympathize with us, like in Palestine, come and invest in Palestine. I can't say it. It's not the case in the business environment. It's, I have to work hard on, as I mentioned early, uh, earlier, the legal framework, ease of doing business, and as well uh, at the comparative advantage that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Now, let me, for the final, what is it, 10, 15 minutes which we have, um, and I'm looking around the room. Behind you. Oh, there, Behind let me, before my question comes. Let's see, where was I? Over there, someone in the back. I can't, I can only see a hand. Yes, madam. Hi, uh, I'm Tina, Global Shaper from Cairo Hub. Yeah. Thank you so much for the session. My question is for Mr. Arif. Um, you are a very conscious uh, investor in Egypt, and you have invested a lot in hospitals, health care, and stuff. Um, my question is, now with the devaluation, it's not the first time that our currency is devaluated. It's happened t uh, two times before this year. Um, how is the dynamics of investment is changing in Egypt after the de devaluation? Is it really more lucrative for investors? Um, how do you see investment in Egypt in general now? So, um, thank you. Uh, it sometimes gives me sleepless nights when <laughs> I watch the impact of currency. But fortunately, um, one of the toolkits in our armory as a private equity firm is that we deploy money for the long term. Okay? And in the long term, and typically in a private equity structure, we have 10-year funds. And although we don't like to stay invested for 10 years, it gives us the resilience and the approach to take a clearer understanding on where an underlying economy is going. Now, if you ask me about where the underlying fundamentals of the economy in Egypt are concerned, I think Egypt is a fantastic growth economy. Uh, we at Abraj are great believers in the Egyptian economic progress. We think that the opportunity uh, is high, and we think that all the factors that contribute to a economy that is ready to break out are present in Egypt. Now, in the short term, contextually, you will find that we have issues around currency. But if I can take you back from the beginning of the Arab Spring till today, uh, with about 10 or 12 investments in Egypt and having, you know, uh, significantly more than a billion dollars deployed in the country, I can tell you that our underlying businesses were growing at 28 to 30 percent every year in local currency terms. So what that gives me is the strength to be able to ride it out and to have the comfort that when that slowdown or when the currency devaluation slows down, 
the impact of returns is going to be greater. Okay? So I do believe very strongly that when one looks at opportunities in markets like Egypt, you examine the underlying fundamentals. And I think that's important because it goes back to local thinking. And if I may, since you asked me a question directly about our business, we've invested over the last 16 years 200 times in 200 companies. And over this period, our loss ratio is under 2%. And when it's under 2%, that's actually pretty good. I'll say that as our own record card, right? Uh, because what it's saying is that in markets that the world considers risky, if you don't lose yeah. capital, there must be something you're doing right. And the most important of it is local understanding. And Egypt is a, a strong component of that thinking. It's a great economy. Don't worry about it. Thank you, Arif. Um, yes, sir. Row, second row, and then I'll get to you. Hi, uh, my name is Abdul Hamid Charar. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Rise Up. It's one of the largest uh, startup conferences. So I'm with the 4IR program here with 100 startups. I'm also a global shaper from Cairo. So sorry for the domination <laughs> on the questions. Actually, the question is a follow-up on Tina's question. Uh, what what can the government and what can uh, businesses do to attract more investors yeah. coming in? So from the other side, what are more incentives that you would want to see as an investor? and other investors coming. You already took your decision and took the risk, and you're doing very well. But how can we attract more? Minister. The role of the government uh, is to attract investors, as well to provide some, to facilitate the investors' uh, business. So one of the uh, government that, uh, action that governments should take is provide incentives. Incentives should be for local and foreign investors. It shouldn't just be for local. Uh, it could be a tax break. It could be like you know uh, providing them with uh, like in the industrial zones, a place to set their uh, businesses, and as well uh, like in our case. You know, we rely on donors. You know, we can provide them with the grants to start. Like, you know, we have in uh, uh, Bethlehem Industrial Zone, it's, we have a grant from the French government yeah, uh, that is given to any investor in the industrial zones up to 50% of the cost of the equipment. Mm. So this is an incentive, I consider it. Same case in Jericho Industrial Zone. Uh, the Japanese government uh, is providing up to 50% of mm. the whole uh, cost of the project. So this is as well incentive. And as I mentioned earlier, the ease of doing business. This is something not tangible, but this is very important for investors to start the uh, business and uh, not to face many difficulties to, uh, to get the approval and to have a strong legal framework. You have to have like, you know, laws, regulations, modern laws and regulations. And as well, you have to have a strong banking and non-banking uh, sector in the country. So all of these factors is the, uh, are the responsibilities of the government. Thank can you. I, can I add something sure. to that? Sure, yeah. So directly uh, answering your question, the role of government uh, in my opinion, get out of the way. <laughs> Thank you very much and get out of the way, right? Because in my book, uh, the private sector has the competence, the capability, and the will to invest in all of these countries. And that is, after all, what capitalism is built on, right? Mm -hmm. And so the issue that is at, f at, at play here is that governments actually in the 21st century should be in the business of governance not in the business of management, okay? And if you follow that theory through, then all they're meant to do is to create the enabling environment, as the minister just stated. If you create the enabling environment and you create a atmosphere where people feel good in investing, then that young man over there is gonna come up with yet another innovative idea and yet more brilliant thinking. And new businesses will thrive. And that is all that government should do. In our world, in MENA, what we have is government is both a regulator, it's an investor, it's a manager, and it is the lawgiver, right? And some of those have to give way because otherwise, 80% of the people in, of the workforce in this region will continue to be uh, employed by government and it's not gonna lead to development. So with respect, 
that is in my book a good approach. Thank, Thank you, Abhi. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, in a moment, David. Uh, we all, all panelists get a final minute, but there are various people here in the room who would like to speak. Yes. Hi, okay. I'm Ayla. I run a project advisory and m and firm in Pakistan. Um, I would like to get panelists' view, and put, put particularly that of Mr. Nakvi, that w when the, in these global, eco uh, global growth economies, there are so many risks prevalent. What are the minimum? Uh, what are the minimum ingredients that the uh, PE and the investors are looking for? And on the other side, what are the minimum that the governments can do? I do agree that the government should get out of the way. But what is this minimum that has to be there so that the governments can also provide that minimum? We'll, we'll get to that in, in a moment. There's a question from a lady in the second row. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alia Mubayed from the IISS. Um, I want to get back to the question of, of um, what we learned um, um, about the episode of the Arab Spring, uh, particularly looking at this region and how it informed our understanding and measurement of risk, as Mr. Nagvi said, to ask maybe some of the panelists on, on how the experience over the last seven years in the region have actually reshaped the approach, whether of the private sector, of an investor, or of a, um, a, a banker who is financing project, or a MIGA uh, who is uh, sort of guaranteeing the risk, in analyzing and in taking on this risk. And the reason why I say, because I think, and maybe here I, I, I take it, uh, I address Mrs. Honda, because I, I remember, I mean, um, that the key uh, issue why investors have thought that the risk in the region was actually low ahead of the Arab Spring was exactly because of their over-reliance on multilateral and international financial institutions who were telling the whole world that Tunisia is the Asian tiger of the Middle East and that this is the way to go and that there is stability in Egypt, etc. So there was a mis, basically, characterization of risk. So, so the question to you is what have we learned? each one of us in our own processes, in our own policy, in our own embedding of risk in our analysis after seven years. Thank you. Thank you. And then there is a question here on row one, and then we'll go back to the panel and each gets Thank you very a minute. Much. Yes. Actually, uh, my question is, uh, it's based on the question that the gentleman from Egypt, the young man over there, asked about incentives. But I want to build it on that. So in a world today where there's a very big debate about free trade agreements, between Euro, the transatlantic free trade agreements. We find Jordan, a small country in the Middle East, we already have a, f a full free trade agreement with the United States of America, a full free trade, free trade agreement with Europe, free trade agreements with Singapore, with the Arab countries. So it's a fantastic market, talking about incentives, where anybody could invest, sell their products competitively to America, to Europe, to Asia, to the Arab world, anything basically. And, and which is something that is extremely competitive. So having this competitive edge and government not interfering and letting the businesses work on, its, the, on their own, I would like to ask you from your experience, uh, Mrs. Honda, so what are the incentives to attract, like the young man asked over there, that countries should give to attract foreign investment, investors to come into the country, keeping the risk that you talk about in mind, but what are the incentives that would allow them to actually come and seriously take up use of those free trade agreements? Thank you, sir. Uh, that brings me to a final one minute for each of the panelists. Really one minute. Uh, <laughs> in the order. Minister. Actually, it's uh, really very interesting, but um, I still uh, believe that, uh, you know, the government cannot set aside because, you know, <laughs> because, you know, the government is responsible for the legal framework. The government is responsible for having bilateral and multilateral agreement. The government is responsible for the enabling environment. So the government should be in, but the government should not interrupt with the uh, businesses, uh, not to, uh, uh, to help the businesses to, uh, to grow and to help them to uh, uh, 
uh, to get like you know uh, whatever is needed from the government in no time. And you know when we look at the experience of Singapore, Singapore was like you know with no resources 50 years ago, and look how it is now. It's like because the government in the enabling environment is great. So, and they have the legal framework. So this is my point of view. Thank uh, you all. Thank you. David. Um, uh, I'm going to agree absolutely with the minister. That's precisely where the government needs to play. Although I, I think the, the Aris point is, is one about kind of hands-on uh, involvement in various management topics. I'm going to make just two final closing points as sort of a summary of those last questions. Um, and one is, is transparency. Um, so the gentleman asked you, what can, what can um, uh, operators do to, to crowd in more investment? And the answer is your transparency of information. You know, I mean, you know, one thing governments can do is encourage more auditors. So we all have, we're all talking the same language. Um, and then lastly, um, back to the, the Egyptian point, uh, demographics and economic growth solves everything. And, um, and the development and the expansion of local capital markets is going to be key to all of this. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting questions. I think today we are able to confirm private investor can play actually a large role in countries in transition. A lot of private investors, by the way, is agreed on sustainable development goal. So therefore, what I'd just like to ask government today is please do not breach the contract you enter into the, gov into the private sector. Also, please do not take excessive control over the private enterprises. And in case, if you also want to deal with more cross-border investment, foreign currency conversion is key. So, so therefore, appreciate government's consideration on it. Then at the same time, we should actually keep encouraging private investor, especially like a cross-border private investor, support the development of young talents, next generation readers of each countries in transitions. Miga would like to continue to support both private side as well as government. Thank you. Thank you, Gaiko. Final one minute. Uh, so, you, so in answer to the I question you question, yeah. so in answer to the question you specifically asked, just remember investing is about the micro opportunity, not the macro opportunity. And in the micro opportunity, the company you create has got to be able to be resilient enough to attract demand. There is absolutely no substitute to the consumer. Focus on the consumer and your company will do well even during the Arab Spring. Okay, focus on the consumer, and that's where the opportunity is. And then the point around government, I do need to say this so that all my visas around the region don't get cancelled. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very important to say that my, my point about getting out of the way is to get out of the way of that private sector investor. Create the enabling environment, go through the process of creating an opportunity set for your people, but the reality is that it is only the private sector that is going to create the innovation, the jobs, the excitement, and the profitability that will lift all the boats in an economy. It cannot possibly be the government acting alone. And it is that which I find the most exciting, which is the spirit of the entrepreneur in the Arab world, the focus of that in this particular summit, which is what caused me to come to it and get that excited about it, is that we have finally recognized that the youth and entrepreneurs have a role to play, and that role cannot now be stopped because disruption is the name of the game. Yeah. Well, a great many thanks to each of the panelists for a very unconventional conversation. Uh, actually, a number of rather rigid conventions have been uh, eroded here, which makes me very happy. Uh, and I especially want to recognize that uh, uh, Global shapers have uh, um, have contributed to to this conversation in a very constructive and, uh, uh, and and important way. So thanks to each of you and to the audience for staying with us during this hour. <laughs>